So the residency program is in many ways a very traditional form in which an artist comes into usually an institution of some kind and works in a variety of ways. Uh, I guess I was surprised by how few examples we have. Um, there may be many that I am unaware of, and I, if you know of any, please let me know. Um, and I was particularly uh, impressed by the fact that two libraries were really trying to rethink what a residency w was, um, fulfilling their missions as sort of evolving institutions in our communities. So um, we'll have a presentation from uh, Weir Farm, uh, Kristen Lassard, um, which is a more fairly traditional residency. They have a number of, a large number of, of artists that come through, and they've been doing this for a long time. They know what they're doing. <laughs> we have, and then we have two examples from libraries who are really, as I said, experimenting. How can an artist make a difference both in our library and then in our, in our community? So um, I would first like to invite Kristen Lassard, you can either sit there or come and stand, whichever you like. David. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm, uh, my name is Kristen Lassard. I'm the Chief of Interpretation, Education, and Volunteers, which is a mouthful, uh, basically in charge of the visitor services and the visitor experience at Weir Farm. I'm just curious, how many of you have been to Weir Farm? Ooh, good, quite a few. How many of you have never heard of Weir Farm and have no idea what it is? It's totally okay, I won't pick on you. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so I'm here to speak about our residency program, but I'll just fill you in a little bit about what Weir Farm is. Um, so Weir Farm is a national park. So we're a national park for the arts, um, and we're the only national park dedicated to American painting out of 417 national park units. So it's very exciting um, to be a national park for the arts and to um, have a great residency program and represent the National Park Service that way. Um, we are um, a home to America's most beloved impressionist, J. Alden Weir. Um, so J. Alden Weir purchased a farm uh, in Branchville, Connecticut, which is now right on the border of Wilton and Ridgefield, so we're in both towns, um, 1882, and there's been a tradition of artists being inspired by the landscape there since, um, unbroken. Um, so we have about uh, 68 acres, hiking trails. We do a lot of art in the park programs. Um, we have a lot to offer to our um, community and to uh, local artists. So um, we get people who come and bring their supplies and plein air paint. Um, the grounds are open year round. We welcome artists. We love seeing artists continue the artistic tradition in the landscape. Um, all different types, and then we also offer art supplies for free of charge and do a variety of programs and try to engage the community in arts and also in their national park. So if you haven't been there, I encourage you to come visit. Um, so our residency is part of a larger um, National Park Service Artist in Residency program. Um, so even though we are one of only two parks dedicated to visual arts, um, there are many, I think over 50 artists in residence programs nationwide throughout National Park. So there's a website up there. You can just Google National Park Artist in Residence and find it. Um, but they're all a little bit different. So, you know, some artists will stay for two weeks or a whole month. Some they get a stipend, some they leave artwork behind um, for the national park. Um, some it's many artists living in a home together, some it's a single artist. So they're all very different and they're managed by their individual parks. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how ours works. Um, first, a little bit of history. So Weir Farm was established as a national park in 1990. Um, so fairly new for a national park. Um, and uh, immediately, you know, being home to three generations of artists and part of our core mission being um, having this tradition continue of artists being inspired and living on site. Uh, we wanted to have an, an art program. So it started out first as a visiting artist program um, where we had uh, up to four artists a year, uh, you know, work in the park and come and visit. And then they had a exhibition in the gallery at the end of the year or sometime for the public to see. 
So that was 1994 they started this visiting artist program. Um, and then it kind of evolved a little bit. So at one point they um, rented out a, a home and made a, an actual residence and an artist space with a studio nearby the park. So artists weren't living in the park, but nearby. Um, so that way artists from you know, around the world, around the country could come you know, live and experience creating art in this national park. Um, so it started out that way, um, and it was really run and managed by the Weir Farm Trust, a park partner. So being a national park, we can't do anything without our partners. We're very grateful to have support of partners and volunteers that can help us run programs like this. So the Weir Farm Trust, um, which is now the Weir Farm Art Center, uh, managed the program and continues to manage the program in partnership with the National Park Service. Um, so um, they manage the program. Um, so for a few years, the artists were living off site, and then the last family of artists that historically lived in the Weir House, the third generation of artists that called Weir Farm home, they had a life tenancy agreement. So they were still residing in the National Park um, even after it was established, which was great. Um, but when they stopped using the caretaker's house, um, one of the buildings on site, uh, we were able to turn that into a residence for artists to come and live and work on site. So that top picture there is a, a picture of the caretaker's house. Um, there was, uh, artists would use the top level as a studio space at first. Um, and then in 2010, that bottom photo shows the modern studio that was built um, based on the footprint of a building that was historically there as part of the farm, a farm shed. So now the artists live in the home and they uh, work in the studio, um, which is like a nice, beautiful modern studio, northern light, lots of ways to adjust the interior space. So it's a really great opportunity for the artists. Uh, one artist at a time, uh, their month-long residencies. So the artists will come, they'll bring their supplies, they'll live in the cottage, it's fully furnished, linens, water, everything provided, they just bring their food and art supplies and help us continue that artistic tradition. Um, lots of different types of artists have come. We've had over 200 artists um, throughout the years that have uh, participated in the program. So applications for the program are managed again by the Weir Farm Art Center. Um, so there's their logo there. They're a wonderful partner. So they handle the application process for the park and uh, coordinating with the artists, um, which is great. So they have a juried selection. So each year um, we get the applications in. Um, it's become more and more competitive over the last probably 10 years or so. I think more artists are getting word. We're getting more applications. Um, there were some years where it was, you know, a handful, um, and now we're getting at least like 30 every time, and that's for 10 to 12 residencies. Um, so they're one-month residencies. They used to be year-round, but last year we stopped doing them in December and January due to weather, heating costs. Um, you know, the park could be closed, uh, things like that. Um, so it's just worked out well to have it February through November, so that's how we do it now. They're actually living within the national park, so they're living in federal buildings. So the National Park Service owns the buildings. You know, we collaborate with the Weir Farm Art Center on the program, but they do manage it for us, which is great. Um, there's not a whole lot of requirements for the artists that come. Um, we don't require they leave a work of art. We don't require they lead a bunch of public programs in the park. Some national parks do that. Um, but we really want the artists to come and have this really authentic, beautiful experience of just connecting with the park, having this moment to step away from there every day and like have, use this place as a retreat and a place for a source of inspiration and just create. Um, and that's something that Jay Alden Weir and all the other artists that have lived at Weir Farm did. So I find that very special. Um, that the artists get to have this experience and they rave about it. Um, you know, they get to have the studio space and just get away um, from their everyday. So um, the only real requirement that they have aside from, you know, taking care of our federal facilities is um, to give one talk uh, to the public. So they give a talk, which happens right now at the Wilton Library. So. There's some more library action. Um, so they give a talk for the public at the Wilton Library at the end of their residency to share their work, and it's a, it's a great experience. But otherwise, they're just left to continue that artistic tradition. Here's some examples of some work from some past artists in residence. Right now, the Weir Farm Art Center is working on a, um, a, a web page that's like a, a 
all the artists' work will be shared on. So they've actually reached out to all 220 past artists. Over 150 have responded with artwork. So they're working on building that page up on their website. Um, you know, so you can look back at all the artists all the way back from 1998 when the residency program started. So it's not just landscape painting. Even though Weir Farm, you know, people think of it, they think of plein air painting, impressionist art inspired by nature and outdoors. Um, so we get a lot of artists that paint, but we get photographers, um, people who work with print, um, all sorts of materials, performance art and video, um, but it's all visual arts um, for the most part examples of artwork. So we see a lot of value from this program. Um, it really has impacts on not only the artists, but also on the park and the visitors and the community. Um, so it helps to continue this artistic tradition at Weir Farm, and that is part of our significance. It's part of the reason we're a national park is because we, um, you know, we have this landscape that has inspired artists and continues to do so. So they help us be relevant and it's a historic site, but the story's still going, which I think is very unique. Um, over 200 artists have had this opportunity to create art at Weir Farm. Um, so it you know, helps their career. I mean, it's a national park program, so it's something that they can include on their, you know, within their, um, in their professional career. And um, plus there's all this beautiful artwork that's been created over the years, so which you've seen some of today. There's connections with artists in, uh, in the community. So at the library talks, you'll often have local artists and people who are excited about art that come and you know, they get talking and get communicating. So it adds this kind of level of, of um, creativity where the artists and residents are speaking with the local artists in the community. And also it exposes new people um, to, to arts as well. So we get people that come to the library talk that aren't artists but come and are exposed to the program. And encourages this kind of community of practice as well. So they're part of this larger thing. Um, and also, for the National Parks perspective, it creates stewards and advocates. So a lot of the artists that have been residents at Weir Farm go on to promote the park, share their artwork, um, you know, nationwide and even worldwide. So that's very exciting for us. So those are some of the impacts of the program. So um, it's a really wonderful program. I have some materials if you guys want to catch up with me after the presentation. Um, you know, where we're always trying to improve the program. So something that we're working on right now is improving the website. The Weir Farm Art Center is updating it with all the work from the artists. We've created a really nice handbook to give to the artists before their residency starts. We've got a nice rap card that we can share and publicize with the community. So even though we have this you know, established program, it's continually evolving and we're continually finding ways to improve it. So, um, and I look forward to learning more from what you guys are doing too. So there's information up there. If you'd like to reach out, um, that's my information. And then Janice Hess is the executive director for the Weir Farm Art Center who manages it with partnership with the park. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That all the slides will be available um, after the event um, and uh, the video will be on YouTube. So next for the um, artist in residence um, program at the Westport um, Library, we um, have both um, Chris Timmons, um, who is working, has been working at the library as the curator of exhibitions for a few years, um, and uh, Migs, who is the first um, artist in residence. Um, so let's see, how are you, um, Chris, are you, would you like to come up or do you want to stay there? Okay, um, I don't know why. Okay. Hi. Um, as David said, this was a fledgling pro program for us, an absolute experiment, um, which was triggered by the arrival in mid-2015 um, of a new 
executive director for the Westport Library, Bill Harmer, who had come from um, the Chelsea Public Library in Michigan. And he had actually um, inaugurated an artist in residence program at the Chelsea Library. And it was a four, four or five year program that involved um, four different artists in different disciplines. And they um, succeeded one another over the long period of the residency. And so he was really interested in this idea of uh, inaugurating a, an artist in residence program at the Westport Library. The, but the first thing that we actually, I had never even spoken with him about this in the beginning. Um, he, the first six months that Bill was at the library, he reached out to the community and very wisely got to know as many people as he could in the community and to listen to what was going on and what people's interests were and needs were in the community, what they were looking for in the library. And one of the people that he reached out to um, was Miggs. And he spent, it doesn't work? It, okay. Sorry. While, while he's fixing that, I'll just keep, keep talking a minute. Um, so he reached out to a number of people in the community uh, to get to know the community better, um, and Miggs was one of them. And he had a number of meetings and dinners with Miggs, and inevitably the idea, the conversation came up of what did Miggs think about artist and residence programs, and they began a discussion there, and pretty soon Bill came back to the library and spoke with me and a number of other people in the library about the, um, the idea of an artist in residence program and wanted to know what we thought about it. And by the way, what, who should be the first artist in residence? And basically, everybody felt there could, couldn't possibly be anybody better than Miggs, that Miggs was absolutely, he grew up in Westport, had lived there, I think, your whole life, except for when he went away to, to college, and is now a working, has long been a working artist in uh, Westport, and is very well known and beloved by the community, and there couldn't possibly be a better first artist in residence. So um, casual as it may seem, it was very heartfelt, and I'm sure we couldn't have found a better first, first artist. Um, the goals that Bill had for the program were first and foremost for MIGS to be an ambassador at large for the library, to reach out to the community and basically continue the connections um, that we had already made in the arts community to strengthen those connections and to build and create new connections and relationships with the arts community and to continue to show, um, help show and promote art by local artists, of which there are numerous professional artists in Westport. I'm sure a lot of people know that. Um, and to help bridge um, new connections with new local artists. Um, the other thing uh, that Bill was really interested in doing was, um, uh, in addition to creating these, uh, strengthening the existing relationships, we were also interested, as the library is always interested, in bringing in new people to the library, people that may be not, who rarely come to the library, who may have never come to the library, who may or may not be conversant or fluent in art, um, and to create a space in the library. And it's interesting, in, in Westport Library, in some libraries um, around Fairfield County actually have dedicated spaces, uh, complete rooms, galleries, that are only for, um, for gallery space, for exhibits. The Westport Library's exhibit space, we had three exhibit spaces, and we're now actually in the midst of a major 21-month renovation of the library, so two of those exhibit spaces on the first floor um, are gone at the moment while they're renovating the first floor and it's under major construction. And the main exhibit space is in the middle of the main second floor of the library. And most people that come to the library are coming for books or information or to study. They happen across art in the library. They don't come to the library for art as they would in a gallery or a museum. 
And so part of the effort um, in terms of exhibits and the interaction with art is to create a space and uh, that is welcoming, to continue to build community and create places where there are no barriers for learning and exploring art of all kinds in the library and to make it really barrier free, not, I'm not speaking about literal barriers, but you know, emotional, psychological barriers so that the art, the library, the process of learning is really accessible to everybody. Um, and basically that is the, li the, pro the um, goal and, uh, of the library in general. So the artist in residence program and the library's um, goals really converge at this point about creating um, a welcoming space for the community at large, building, continuing to build community relationships and to um, have those relationships be really inclusive, not exclusive, and barrier-free. So with MIGS, we're going to talk about the programs that we inaugurated. MIGS presented us with, a, with an outline of ideas, and he and I and some of the other people discussed these ideas. We talked about what might work and what we would put to, towards the end of the list, and Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, David and Angela, the dynamic duo of Cultural Alliance for making this happen. Um, yeah, so this was, I called it seat of the pants, Chris calls it organic. Uh, <laughs> uh, approach to being an artist in residence. Uh, I still have people ask me where I slept at night. Um, it wasn't, I visited the library, um, but as an ambassador, I was available for different projects that just came up, which was wonderful, you know, just spur of the moment type things. Uh, and things evolved, which was nice. So it was organic in that way. Um, the, uh, okay, slides have a, am I supposed to point this in? Where's the, over there? <laughs> uh, anyway, we came up with the concept of um, community challenges, a monthly community challenge, design challenge. Um, to engage the community. It was all about engagement. Um, and uh, the idea was, you know, art exhibits can be somewhat passive. I mean, you're looking at work on a wall. We wanted the community to become um, this. Yeah, I was in this the Westport Downtown Arts Festival, which is an annual event for the last couple of decades. So the library had a booth, and I sort of curated the art in the booth, and it was just a way to introduce what was going on with the arts uh, at the library. But I think, you know, uh, Westport's long been known as an, an artist community. My father was part of the wave of the golden age of illustrators and commercial artists in the 1950s. So I sort of have that heritage. But um, the idea was to make every member of the community feel like they could be part of the Westport arts you know, community. I mean, be a, be a Westport artist, uh, whether they were professional or never touched the arts at all. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So this, uh, the next... Sorry. Um, this was sort of a little, a little design challenge. Uh, you don't need to be an artist to participate, and this is not a competition or juried exhibit. The point is to play with design and have fun. It was, you know, not to meant judgmental, nothing was curated, nothing was juried, and um, some of the, um, let me go to the next. This is there. Okay. Um, so the first, I think the very first one was called the selfies, and the other aspect that I had in mind, I did not want this to be a digital, uh, you know, experiment. This was meant to be kind of old school, just use your, you know, use your eyes and your brain and your sensitivity to bring to these things. And uh, so the selfie, we all know selfies is something you hold the phone up to, but um, this was meant to be, they, they could be digital, it wasn't prohibited, but um, these were just self-portraits and we, we decided on a size of six inches square, I think, as tiling so we could put them in a hallway down in the library and people could go by and, and sort of tile the walls with these. So it shows a variety of 
you know, from drawing to painting, photography, and um, that was really a very successful kickoff to this. A lot of people participated who may never have done art before, and I'm sorry? We have one minute left. Oh, okay, well, let's just skip. Can you just forge ahead and we'll just... Uh, this was finding faces in everyday objects, um, which people could take photos of. Uh, there's still, people are still sending, you, next one. This is just one example. This was, I was at a restaurant actually and looking down, I was looking across from was somebody next to me and I just happened to notice the tears in their pants and that's what it looked like, uh, but it's a face, okay. Um, we got a lot of uh, public, you know, local media attention. Um, this is uh, holding a session on, I did one of the sessions which was sort of, some people objected to because it was so sacred is to redesign the peace symbol for the 21st century. You know, what does peace mean today and what, anyway, but that was, we go to the next one. Uh, what did evolve organically was me interviewing some of the artists that were having exhibits there. Um, I became an interviewer of fellow artists. And the, the last and probably the most uh, successful one was uh, A Day in the Life of Westport, where we did um, uh, invite people to, on one, a given day, the summer solstice, they were to take, shoot something in Westport that represented Westport to them. So this was, these were all taken on the same day. We had this huge exhibit that was over 90, I think 90 entries. And as you can see, you know, it went up and down the wall there, and it was just phenomenal. And then at the end, the last one, um, last, well, two slides, I had my own exhibit, uh, my farewell exhibit was in the library. Uh, and there it is, I do lenticular work, which is photos that change. And the last one just shows, you know, the kind of turnout in the, the library space. So it was very, so it was very um, satisfying and success is in the eyes of, the beholder and the participants, but uh, we've got a lot of, um, and, and, and I love working, everybody at the library was such a great team, and Chris was a collaborator on everything. And um, so I didn't sleep there, but I think we got a lot done. <laughs> and I think we'll definitely do more of these, but at the moment there's a hiatus given the construction of the library. Um, but when we do, when the library's reopened, well, it's currently open, but when it's renovated and finished, I think we'll certainly do more, but they'll be in different, another dif discipline, you know, different huh. disciplines. So it's sort of on hiatus, or it makes this I think, kind of yeah, re ready I mean, it's to... a little hard. We're going to be reduced to the first floor, and nothing. Yeah. Like, 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 I'm finishing the construction. So has MIG's tenure finished? Yes, uh -huh. it finished with this exhibit that he had. Oh, we'll keep tuned. Yeah. So next is Crystal from the New Canaan Public Library. Hope this PowerPoint works. What happened? Can it quickly make sure this works? Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so I'm Crystal Chumney. I'm the manager of public services at New Canaan Library. Um, really honored to be um, asked to participate and quite frankly, really in awe of all the work that you're doing. I hope I say something valuable here. So, <laughs> um, okay. So, you know, you might be asking yourselves why libraries are a good fit for artists in residence programs. But actually, libraries and the arts have a very long history together, actually dating back to the Library of Alexandria, which was dedicated to the muse, the nine goddesses of the arts. Libraries have long supported artists, promoted art education and discovery, provided art history research and provenance, archived and collected materials about great artists, and many actually exhibit play, um, works of art in their library. Libraries have continued to carry on their core mission, and as they have transformed their services in the 21st century, innovative new program programming ideas have come about. From kombucha making to film festivals, 
to portrait drawing workshops, libraries have changed the way that the public interacts with them and provided space for new inspiration to happen. And the next logical step should be artist residency programs. And this quote was from the American Library Association's annual conference in 2016, and I think it really illustrates the opportunity for libraries. I won't read it to you, you can all read. <laughs> so how we got started, much like Westport, um, really humble beginnings and very organic. <laughs> so we, in 2014, we had a first dedicated uh, programming librarian. Her name was Erin Batikiefer, and she came to us from the Madison Public Library in Wisconsin. And while she was there, um, Madison Public Library received an NEA Artworks grant and an IMLS grant to create a maker and art space. It's quite wonderful. Um, it's called The Bubbler, and The Bubbler is a permanent art and maker space at the library. And at the Bubbler, they started an artist residency program. They host many more than we do. Um, and it's really a way for their audience to find inspiration and to participate in art making and really to break down those barriers that we've all been talking about today. Now, at the library, we do have a permanent gallery space, but we do not have anything like the Bubbler. But we really love the idea, and Erin had a lot of experience with that, and she was an artist herself and a big advocate for this. So, you know, we just said, all right, well, we'll just try it. Um, a few team, team members knew a local architect who had done some hands-on workshops at another library. It was actually Westport. And we thought that he might be a good fit. So we approached the artist and he loved the idea. We made a joint plan of how to move forward, what kind of engagement we would provide, and what goals we wanted to achieve. Again, this was our first very organic growth. It was very loose. About five months before the project was set to launch, the architect got an excellent opportunity to, become te to begin teaching at the Clemson Architecture Studio um, in Clemson, South Carolina. So um, something I have not mentioned up to this point, but the library is in the process of um, a capital campaign to build a new library. And so the architect came to us and said, is there a way to combine this opportunity for my teaching and to combine some of the long-term goals of the library? And um, the stu his students needed a project, and so they decided to make it New Canaan Library was their semester project. And um, it really was a change from the sketch sketchbook exhibition we had planned into this exhibition where the students' work would be the actual exhibition. Um, and one of the things we really thought would be interesting, which was pertinent to this conversation, was that it would allow um, the community to really see what a new library could be. If you're just looking at an existing building, it's really hard to imagine what it could be if you're not there every day and it's not your job to think about what that is. And, um, you know, libraries have long had a thought of, you just go there for books, but as we've seen, that's not really the case. Um, so our first artist in residence, his name was Joseph Schott, architect and professor. He had a um, five, I'm sorry, four week exhibition called Studies in Architecture. And it was actually the display of 10 Clemson University Architect students, and he conducted public workshops. And um, they featured models and drawings that demonstrated the architectural design process. We actually hosted the 10 students at the library prior to the exhibition, actually prior to their midterm point. And myself and the library director actually went to the Clemson studio. So this was really a departure from what we had planned, but we did let it grow organically. And, and it was a really good experience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we did hold, or Joseph held three hands-on architectural workshops. They were mainly with students, you can see down here. And it was to really um, build on basic modeling skills. We also hosted a TEDx salon discussion that um, featured some local architects and talked about libraries and other public spaces and architecture. And then we had a really nice closing reception with Joseph where the public could interact with the actual exhibition itself and ask questions. And here is, um, my iPhone pictures, so sorry if they're blurry. But you can see some of the art that was displayed and the sketchbooks, if you can see, were hanging from the ceiling down and they were, hit, they were all around the gallery. And um, the students had to write what their vision was for the library and how their design process was and um, really all the pieces that went along with it. Here were some of their models, which I thought were pretty interesting. My favorite is the one with the little trees. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say out of this is it really did create new community discussions about the library. Now, we had a lot of questions that weren't pertinent, like, are the students designing your library? 
No, we have professional architects who we've engaged <laughs> many years ago. Um, but it, what it really did was create community conversation. That was really our big goal. Also, um, many of you probably know this, but New Canaan is home to the Harvard Five, and so there is a great interest in um, mid-modern architecture there, and, um, and there, that also was a great appetite for learning more about architecture. As a total aside, we have a partnership with the Glass House that talks about architecture a number of times a year, and we regularly have 200 people attend. So to be honest, we picked a low-hanging fruit for someone that we knew the community would have an interest in because we had no idea what we were doing. Um, so the one thing, one, some of the things when I was talking to David that I thought were important to share were what did we learn? Um, we learned we really needed a project management approach to this. Um, loose guidelines didn't work very well for the staff in terms of timeline, manpower, and workload. Um, with the large volume of programs we put on for the adult services, it's more than 40 programs a month. Um, we really needed a well-defined structure and for including project roles, responsibilities, schedule, and communication. And from a personal standpoint, that was really challenging for the staff and distracted us a lot from um, what else we could do from the community. So that was a big takeaway from us. We also learned that we needed a clear mission statement and formal guidelines so that we could convey that to the artists about what we were hoping to achieve and what were the expectations of the residency. And, and also do that up front so that artists who were interested in this would apply for that and, and were interested in participating that way. Um, we also knew that based on the community and artist inquiry that we received throughout the project, we needed to have a formal application process. Again, we just asked someone much like Westport did, <laughs> and um, you, we realized that we needed something more formal. So what did we make changes for the second time? Um, we created an internal working committee, and this committee worked to create the formal application process. We used existing procedures from our art committee that actually curates art all year round at the library. And we formed a formal committee for selection as well. Um, one of the library staff members, it's currently myself, is the chair. And we also involve, involve the chairs of the art committee who were very experienced in curating art. We are librarians. That is not our forte. Um, we conducted an open call for artists for three months. And we, act with the help of the Cultural Alliance, we actually received 18 applications, which was far more than I was expecting. Um, and while this was going on, we also received new branding at the library, and you can see this over here. We rebranded um, the artist in residency in a kind of very generic way, and you'll see how we will incorporate it in the future. Um, we accepted all the submissions by the end of November, and we made our selection by the end of December. So back to that timeline, it was really important for us because we have a lot of moving parts. Um, I just wanted to briefly show this is what the application looked like. I'm happy to share this with anyone. We did make it available online and in print. Um, basically, we asked them for an overview. We asked them to submit at least three proposals for community interaction. So that's a big part of what our residency um, hopes to achieve. So we have selected our next artist. And coming in April of 2018, our artist will be Alyssa Siegel. I think she is actually part of the Cultural Alliance. Um, we're really delighted to have her. She is a painter, and she resides in Stamford. She was the top choice by the committee, and I thought I'd share a little bit about, from the library standpoint, why we chose her. Of course, her art was beautiful, and it was very interpretive. She presented very well thought out workshops and different and interesting ways to engage the community. Um, she has an art education and museum background and a vast experience working with the public. She also had a clear understanding of the goals, back to what we implemented. And she had a lot of enthusiasm for participating. Um, from my standpoint, that was really, that was like an extra bonus. Um, here's a little preview of her work. And you'll see over here where the artists in residence, we have incorporated this into our branding. And it's a way to feature the artist's work, but to also incorporate it with um, the library messaging, which we use everywhere. Yeah, so actually, it's an aside, but the um, branding on the slides is also part of our branding. <laughs> so um, looking forward, you know, this is only our second year, and I'm always thinking about what do we want this to be. I'd really like to be able to open our residency up to different platforms of artists, so writers, illustrators, filmmakers, other artistic communities. And I'd like to also find other communities and partners um, with whom we can work with to really expand the program and, and, and also think about what else it could be. Um, 
one of the things is right now we fund this program internally with programs, so that really limits um, what we can offer. It also limits the amount of residencies that we can um, offer. So that's something I'd like to think about, either private funding, we are an association library, meaning that we get a significant portion of our funding from donations. And so this is something I want to look forward to. Um, possibly hosting multiple artists per year, and in a new library, dedicated space. I don't think they will sleep with the library. Um, but it really goes back to something that was mentioned earlier about funneling young artists in. Without a dedicated space, we're really repurposing space that is public space to do this. And so that is a, a limitation for, um, for our residency. So. I hope you're now inspired to start a residency. Sounds great, where do I begin? Um, so I'll just tell you a few of the things that I think were really important in our success. Um, finding champions in your organization. So we had a programming librarian who had a good idea. The director, who is uh, my boss, is very supportive of the arts. And that was a great way because we had executive support and enough kind of manpower to make it happen. Um, I also, on my second round, solicited more help from the community. So I solicited help from our art committee, who one of our chairs is here. Thank you, Mary. And um, also other people in the community who had expressed interest in that because I cannot do it all by myself. As an aside, last year I had to take down part of the exhibition myself and I was standing the ceiling on a Sunday before the library opened. And that was a lesson for me, okay, I need to ask for more help going forward. Um, I said formulate an, or an organic plan. So I think it's important to have some goals but to also let it evolve. I think that's one of the beautiful things about art is that it grows into something else. Um, when we were looking at the Bridgeport stairs earlier and the art out of art and that's really what I kind of see this program as as well. Um, my really big key takeaway is create and stick to a firm schedule. And um, that, was really, uh, that was really a sticking point in the earlier one and something that we, w we handled organically and we maybe should have been a little more firm about that. Project management is really the key to you and your staff's success. Um, and also find artists in your community who reflect either your community or help you achieve your institutional goals. It was really our reason for selecting Joseph in the first round. Um, we've allowed it to change from that, but I think that was um, why it was so well received. And also expect to learn, also known as you will make lots of mistakes, and that is okay. Um, we certainly made plenty of them and had lots of sleepless nights and hair pulling. Um, but I think in the end, we ended up having a lot of fun. And I think that art should really inspire people. And the library is a place where they can find inspiration. And so I do, again, think it's a perfect fit. So that is it. <laughs>